It's July 1982. You pick up the latest Omni magazine and you read a new story, Burning Chrome by a fairly new author, William Gibson. You put down the magazine and go watch Blade Runner in theaters. After the film, all of a sudden you look down and see a tortoise. It's crawling toward you. You reach down and flip the tortoise over on its back. The tortoise lays on its back, its belly baking in the hot sun, beating its legs trying to turn itself over, but it can't. Not without your help, but you're not helping. You're experiencing double vision. Today we're looking at two major foundational works of cyberpunk, a genre that looks at this low-life undercurrent in a high-tech world where, as technology is rapidly advancing, you have these subsets of society that are being left behind. And so you have, on the one hand, William Gibson as this literary writer, and then you have Blade Runner as this sort of major cyberpunk film. And so the story Burning Chrome we're looking at comes out just a few weeks after Blade Runner comes out in theaters in the summer of 1982. And so you have this one major moment where this sort of comes together. And so something interesting with the film Blade Runner is it's roughly adapting this 1968 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. And Philip K. Dick is also one of the influences for... Gibson and others writing in this period at this moment. So you have this science fiction novel in the 60s, and then you take the same basic story and you make it a film in the 80s, and somehow it's a defining instance of this whole new subgenre. And so how does that work? And so a big part of it is the atmosphere of the film, the sort of visual style comes to define this way in which this sort of high-tech future cyberpunk sort of city, these sorts of characters, the sort of design of apartments and so on would look like. But one of the big legacies for William Gibson is not the sort of outer world, but the virtual one, this idea of cyberspace. And so the critical thing with this story Burning Chrome is this is his first time he uses the term cyberspace it's a colorless non-space, it's an electronic consensus hallucination that facilitates the handling and exchange of massive quantities of data. And so you have, you know, these online networks where different computers and servers are connecting and you have information being exchanged. And so their computer, for instance, is represented as this abstract little yellow pyramid but within this there's this imaginative projection of you as all of these sorts of things that you're connecting through you as sort of existing within this space and so throughout the story they're sort of identifying themselves as becoming all these sorts of things where they say for instance we just became an eastern seaboard fission authority inspection probe we just told chrome we're an irs audit in three supreme court subpoenas it's this thrilling bodiless experience they're moving fast there are the, all these different connections The narrator Automatic Jack says, Somewhere we have bodies very far away in a crowded loft roof with steel and glass. But they're in this new cybernetic existence. And so William Gibson at various points talks about his inspiration for all of this. And so there's a sort of common note that he had never used a computer until long after he had wrote these sort of early stories, wrote Neuromancer and such. And so what he does see, though, is you have arcade games with very simplistic graphics. You know, this is 1982 at this point, and you have ads for early personal computers. And so he sees, for one thing, that computers are getting smaller and smaller, and he anticipates eventually it'll be this tiny little thing you carry everywhere with you. And he sees these kids crowded around this arcade machine, and he senses that what they really want is to get up inside of it to be part of the notional space of the machine. And so he imagines this future where people are so sort of immersed into these technologies. And what is sort of interesting is this sort of low-life element of this, where it's not just the sort of ultimate extent of this and this sort of people who can afford all the best tech, but it's about these really, you know, sort of average and perhaps even below average people making do with what they can, sort of scraping by, 
having to deal with the sort of things that you can't get away from and what does the sort of underbelly of this world look like and so you have two main groups of people in burning chrome you have the narrator automatic jack with his partner bobby who are these sorts of um criminals doing sort of electronic heists and so on and then you have this younger girl ricky who wants to be a simstim star and so simstim is this simulated stimulation it's basically virtual reality uh social media influencers kind of thing where you have these new kinds of online stars like the way we today you know get to know people through instagram snapchat tiktok and so on they connect into these sorts of simulated experiences and you experience the sensations of these people and it's you know of course edited and framed and so on so it's only the interesting stuff but it's simulating like you're being them and so they become this new kind of star and ricky as what is you know then the sort of equivalent of the sort of zoomer figure wants to be one herself so she wants to go off into hollywood or what is an even higher version of that chiba city and become one of these stars but requires taking on this very sort of you know corrected appearance getting a lot of plastic surgery and so on and especially the goal for her is to get these fancy designer eyes but the core story is these two guys sitting around a computer trying to hack into the bank account of this mobster and to steal her money so that, you know, they can be rich and retire. You know, they're getting older and they need one last big score so that they can sort of feel like they've accomplished something and not just they've withered away and leave off rich instead of, you know, they're pretty broke at this time. So how does Gibson make a compelling story out of two people sitting in front of a computer screen? He does it through this metaphorical layering. So Bobby is a computer cowboy as probably the most culturally lasting image but he's also a cybernetic second story man the sort of burglar goes in through the second floor window of a house he is really good at getting into things and jack is good with the hardware and so jack is narrating the story and he gets his hands on this stolen russian military software and so that allows him to hype it up and the way gibson structures this is it's sort of non-linear where you have them doing the heist and then it goes back to meeting Ricky and getting the software and getting everything set up and doing the heist and it goes back and forth and so you see them getting closer and closer and with this constant threat that if they fail they're going to be killed by this mobster then in Blade Runner you have this dynamic where because it's a visual medium you can make everything sort of just readily apparently look cool so we're in Burning Chrome you you also have this neon and smoke filled urban sprawl in blade runner you get to see this sort of long spread of lights you see the giant ziggurat that's the tyrell corporation you see flying cars and deckard the main character has a sort of fancy designed gun he has this cool looking apartment and and everything and instead of sitting down at a computer hacking a bank account he's physically traversing through a city hunting down these other humanoid characters and it's a high-tech city but it's not quite a computerized city in the same extent that burning chrome is you know there is there's one long scene where he's enhancing and moving around this photograph he'll pull up information about his targets on screens he'll do this sort of void comp test where you're scanning eyeballs for tiny little indications of response time for this empathy test that's all sort of computerized in a sense but it's not the same look that you get with gibson where he's imagining this sort of cyber space which is you know not necessarily a given that you imagine it as a space that you're actually in and navigating and so you have these two very different visions where in gibson you have this non-embodied experience where you are these sorts of abstract bits of information and connections between servers and it's just about this sort of sense of raw speed and even when 
you're obsessed with the body and thinking about eyes and such. It's all these sorts of replaceable images for these computerized virtual experiences. And it's not about being sort of these real people out in the world. And so that's one of the narrator's concerns is Bobby is dating this girl, Ricky, but he doesn't really quite understand that she's this real person who's right there and he can just sort of stop and interact with her. And the extreme low-life extension of this is Chrome's business, which is the House of Blue Life, where it's basically like a brothel, except the woman is hooked up where she enters this experience of sleep, but her body goes on this sort of autopilot. And so while Jack and Bobby are ignoring Ricky toward the end, trying to get this heist done, get this money... And Jack is sort of thinking about her and thinking, oh, we can use this money to buy her these eyes. Ricky is sort of going off on her own and taking care of herself and working in the House of Blue Lights. And so in the end, they pull off the heist to get the money. But then he goes and he finds Ricky and she already has the eyes. She already has this ticket to Hollywood and she's she's going to go off on her own. And he tries to intercept again and replace her plane ticket to one of Chiba City. But she blows him off. And so when Bobby first met her several weeks ago, she was new to the city and he introduced her to how it all works and major players and so on. And while they're trying to do their thing, she adapts and makes her own way. All of these characters operating outside of the law. The vision in Blade Runner, meanwhile, is that by being an embodied being out in the world, going through experiences, what starts out as these genetically engineered beings called replicants, they don't have real emotions, they simulate them, but if they're alive for several years, then they start to develop real emotions, and so they put into them this strict four-year lifespan, after which they start to rapidly decay and die. And so that's the thrust of the replicants' story, where they're on these off-world colonies, and they kill their way to Earth, and they're trying to meet their maker, Tyrell, and get him to expand their lifespans. And so while Tyrell's motto is more human than human, ultimately they can't allow them to become fully human because they use them as slave labor. And and so that's set up in this sort of opening crawl where they have these off-world colonies because the world is so polluted, destroyed, whatever, that you need to sort of start over and expand out into space. And so they use these replicants for labor, and in some cases, uh, what they call pleasure models. That's what the character Pris is designed for, because they have these military figures isolated out in space, and so they just make replicants to keep them company, and that's supposed to remove the ethical dilemma. But, you know, there's, of course, this sort of racial metaphor where basically you think of these as non-human, less than you, and so you can do whatever with them, it doesn't really matter. And so the main character, Deckard, is this bounty hunter called the Blade Runner who, who has to go after escaped replicants and kill them. But it's not called killing. It's emphasized a few times. It's called retirement because they're purely these sort of working beings. And so once their time is up, you retire them and it's no big deal. But he has these sorts of moral qualms. And so when the film starts, he's already retired and he's brought in to do this one last job because the person who originally was trying to interview one of the replicants ended up getting shot by one of the replicants. And so you have these two different narratives of people doing one last big job before they really, really retire for good this time. But in Deckard's case, it's essentially by force where he doesn't want to do it. He gives the police a tough time, but they threaten him and say, if you're not one of us, if you're not cop, you're little people. And so implicit in that is this dynamic where if he doesn't want to do it, it could be him getting hunted down just the same. There's a comment in the voiceovers that were in the original theatrical release that got later cut out in the director's cut and final cut and so on. But in the original cut, you have Harrison Ford as Deckard giving commentary about what's going on in the movie, explaining some things and so on. And one of the things they make really clear is that he says Inspector Bryant, this sort of sleazy looking guy who's his boss, 
that he's the kind of cop who in the old days would have called black men the n-word and when you take out the voiceovers in later editions it's still implicitly suggested where they're called skin jobs and so you have this made-up slur for fake skin beings then this other cop gaff is the sort of mysterious guy he keeps making these origami animals in the director's cut it's used to imply that deckard is himself a replicant because gaff knows what's in deckard's dreams implying they've been implanted but ultimately it just leaves off this sense that he has some sort of scheming overlook on things that Decker doesn't really seem to be into. He's he's getting dragged along the whole way, and there's this sort of twist where he's supposed to kill the escaped replicants, but then he learns that there's another one from the Tyrell Corporation that he falls for. And so at a certain point, he's told that he has four more kills to go, and he's like, wait, there's only three? And they're like, no, 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 four. There's the Tyrell woman. And so that's the dynamic where if you're not cop, you're little people, where if you're categorized the wrong way, they'll hunt you down and kill you. And so you have that part of the atmosphere of the film where it's this really isolating, threatening world. And so it's within that context that it's this small scale miracle that Deckard and Rachel connect with each other and finally have someone to kind of look over them in a serious capacity and to actually care and not just be running some sort of experiment or using them for some sort of job. And we see in the wider world where you have, you know, this dark city constantly raining. So you have these scavengers picking apart parts of cars and so on, and you have this lively sprawling city and one of the interesting things that shifts from the the novel is in the novel it's very sparsely populated and you see that in the movie with jf sebastian where he has this big building that is otherwise empty and so you have these parts of the the city that are uninhabitable almost uh except for him who has a sort of disease anyway and so he can live there because he has no hope of being healthy enough to get off world but otherwise people sort of live in this very dense urban sprawl full of tall buildings and lights and neon lights and big advertisements and you have these high-tech blimps overhead with big signs advertising the off-world colonies with booming audio advertisements saying you know come and go off world and the descriptions of the city in burning chrome actually run very similar at many points where you have the same sort of pollution you have the the neon you have this description of this half completed dome overhead so you have this sense that the sprawl needed to be enclosed off but the sort of inequality is such that they didn't even actually complete the project things sort of fell apart And with the neon, Gibson opens with this line about the moss batting themselves to death against it. And then the image comes up again later with this store where there's a lot of dead flies under this neon sign covered in dust that they've just been piling up forever and so it's the same concept with the characters where you have these people getting these fake eye implants so they can be like these simstim stars even though if you don't get the really expensive ones it can go very poorly you can get this permanent optical degeneration and that that simstim world with the ricky plot versus the rachel plot in blade runner i think is really this interesting key to thinking about the distinct visions of these two foundational cyberpunk works in the case of rachel She thought she was a real person, she had these memories, she has photographs, and then it's revealed to her that actually she's a replicant. And she also understands what that means is that, so one, she has a limited lifespan, and two, they'll probably actually just shoot her. She tells Deckard at one point, tears in her eyes, I'm not in the business, I am the business. And she's this experiment where they found that they can actually really successfully implant someone else's memories into these replicants and give them this accelerated emotional development, make them think that they're real, and it becomes this way of controlling them where when they know that they're replicants, they have this potential to want to rebel but if they don't know they'll just live their life and do whatever they think their sort of task is to do 
she runs off to Deckard for comforting, for protection, and they ultimately run off in this almost multonic moment of Adam and Eve hand in hand leaving Eden in their solitary way, kicked out of paradise, cursed with this knowledge of what she is and her nakedness and so on. But Ricky's moving in the complete opposite direction. She is an actual person. She has her whole life, her whole memories, her own body, and all of this, but she wants to, one, live in the simulated stimulation world of the stars. She spends hours hooked up into these systems, living the life of her favorite star, this guy Tally Isham, and she wants to have that same job, live that life of Sim Sim Star. And in a later Gibson story, you have this more extreme version of this where someone gets uploaded to the net and their body is completely destroyed with ricky it's it's these more minor things sort of surgical corrections fake eyes and so on trying to become this standardized celebrity image where in the end jack comments how he sees these ads for these sim sim stars and he sees ricky and all of them because they all have these identical eyes this general identical look but the faces are never quite ricky's he never quite sees her and so it seems like maybe she didn't make it as a star right it's this very cutthroat world trying to achieve that sort of fame and so even though she goes and sells her body in the house of blue lights and gets the surgery and gets the eyes and everything and goes off into hollywood she doesn't seem to quite achieve her goal but this is in some ways the same thing with blade runner the sense that um she won't live but then again who does and in the theatrical version there's this extended ending where they're driving off through this sort of like wooded road and there's this vast landscapes of mountains and valleys and so on and the sense of you know that they didn't know how long rachel had left and so they're just gonna go and live their life because really no one knows how long they have left and all you can do is just live the best that you can and so there's this thriver mindset of scraping together what you can and making do in this really run-down world. And it's this really bleak depiction overall, but in some ways I think the Gibson story is even bleaker. You know, you have this idea that the street finds its own uses for things, but the way that's introduced is you have this pharmaceutical that's designed to treat senile amnesia, and so it brings back memories with this really strong force and so people who don't have amnesia take it and then something like a recent relationship that ended in the case of the narrator it comes back in full and you're reliving all these moments in this sort of full reality and it's this parallel to what ricky is doing with the sim stim where they're not living in the moment they're living these simulations whether through technology or through drugs of these other moments in either their own lives or other lives they put everything on the line and really get nothing out of it everyone ends up kind of alone and miserable at least the conclusion of blade runner is the sense that deckard and rachel can find each other and they can have some at least temporary hope of a future Future, uh, where they're free to some capacity but in Gibson it's it's just you you go from one captivity to another you're always just these moss batting themselves to death against the neon and so you have Gibson's vision here in the summer of 1982 where he's seeing these arcades he's seeing these personal computing ads and it's like, you know, as this technology advances, what will it be like to live inside these machines? And so he always says that he's not prophesizing the future, he's writing about the present. And so the answer to that, what will it be like, is, well, you just look at what's going on now, and you extrapolate that. And so the story is a commentary on the sense of inequality and, and so on that he sees in his present society in the early 1980s. With the crumbling infrastructure and the overdependence on pharmaceuticals and the technology that's not really designed for people's benefit. And then with Ridley Scott, you have the same basic vision of this world of inequality, violence, pollution, racism, so on. But within that, Ridley Scott is able to find this vaguely optimistic exploration of what it is to be human, what it means to feel things and to have these individual experiences. One thing that that I think gets lost, though, is 
you have this famous moment at the end where Roy, I mean, he does a good thing in saving Deckard, and then he gives this speech, and he says, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe, and how these moments will be lost in time, like tears and rain. But it's really this this very performative, dramatic moment where he's putting on this show to Deckard to show that he is this really deeply feeling human. And it's the same sort of dynamic that you have in the novel Frankenstein, where both Dr. Frankenstein and his creature are competing to say, no, no, I feel more strongly than you ever did. I grieve so much more deeply. And yet, to some extent, what they're drawing on is not their own internal feelings, but this reference of sort of texts and rhetorical effects that express what they think they need to be expressing. And so even in this moving moment, Roy is saying things that earlier the other replicant, Leon, was saying word for word in his moment of trying to kill Deckard and then being shot himself. And so Roy probably thinks that he's being really original and personal and so on, but he's just at the point where he's still at the cusp of developing his own emotions. Some of this is just what's baked into these Nexus 6 replicants, and yet he's still reaching toward this ideal that Deckard sees that he doesn't get to reach in his life and so it and there's this freedom that opens up once he and Rachel are being chased and so in both visions you have this sense that nothing is radically changing as this technology is expanding but what but to what extent is there right now this opportunity for genuine freedom and meaning in life that's the core distinction in these two visions cyberpunk tends to be pretty bleak but just how bleak do you want it Thank you.